Well, it seems like the Pac-12 media deal is coming soon. So what should the goals be? Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pack 12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with our beloved Conference of Champions. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe wherever you listen to or watch this show. And please continue as well to send in your mailbag questions because you've had a lot of great ones and there are a lot of things to discuss right now surrounding the Pack 12. This question comes in via the YouTube comments. You can hit me up on there or on Twitter. From Bud Evert, what is the annual payout from the upcoming media deal that would be considered a success and allow the PAC to compete with other conferences? This is a great question. Now, when you're talking about competing with other conferences after losing USC and UCLA, when you're already way behind the Big Ten and the SEC, those two conferences I am throwing to the side. I am not going to look at what the Big Ten gets or what the SEC gets and compare that to the Pac-12 deal and then use that to determine in my head, yeah, okay, they did well or no, they did not do well. Because those leagues are a step above everybody else. And I think we all understand that. So let's go to the leagues that the Pac-12 does need to be able to keep pace with from a competitiveness standpoint, which is what we're talking about here. Right. With regards to the media rights deal, more money for the athletic department. You can pay coaches, you can pay recruits in NIL or something. You know, I don't know. You get the picture there. Facilities, stadium, whatever. That's what we're talking about in terms of keeping pace. The Big 12 and the ACC both have deals that have been put pen there that have had pen put to paper. That was way too much, but I tried it anyway and we got through it, that take them at least through 2030 and pay them in the range. Now, these can fluctuate a little bit. It's not the exact same every year because it's more if you get a team in the playoff or NCAA tournament games can get you a little bit more as well. If a team makes a deep run like TCU, that, that gets a little bit of extra money for each school because the conference gets to go to the playoff and the national championship game. They are paying somewhere in the 31 to $32 million range per year on average. If the Pac-12 is over 30, I think that's fine. I do. Now, if it comes in under 30 million and it's at 28, let, let's, let's say the number were 28, would that be good? No. Would it be the end of the world? Also no. Because at the end of the day, a couple million per school is not making that much of a difference. What is, in theory, are the tens of millions of dollars that the Big Ten and SEC can get. But we've already established, right, that that's not a realistic scenario for the Pac-12 or the Big 12 or the ACC. So I think anything over the $30 million threshold in terms of media rights payouts per school per year and, and you know any expansion teams that they add don't apply to that because they'll be on uh, a, a temporary deal of sorts, which which I'll touch on in a moment. As long as you're in that ballpark and you're competitive or in the same range as the other two conferences, I think that that can be shocked up pretty easily as a success. I think it would be disappointing if they came in closer to 25 and you're going, okay, so we're the only conference that is paying in the 20s and it's many millions behind the other schools in other leagues that are comparable to ours, that's not great. But if they can just get over 30, then any amount of difference would be pretty negligible. And I do think they can. Based on what I have heard, I think they can get around 30. I think their ceiling is capped at the mid to high 30s. And I mean like their utmost upper ceiling. Like if they knocked it out of the park and Amazon decided to maybe be willing to overpay a little bit or some cable partner, which won't be CBS and Turner, apparently, because we heard that from Brett McMurphy yesterday, 
I think the uppermost ceiling is in the high 30s. I if they got 40, I would come on here and just be pretty floored in a great way for the conference. I don't think that's particularly likely. But if they can get pre college football playoff expansion numbers that are in the low to mid 30s, then I think they are doing well. And compared to their peer conferences, they would be doing well. Now, one thing that I am I am going to make a prediction on here. I do not anticipate that the media rights deal, which should be coming out in the next couple of weeks, that is what, let's just say I've heard along the grapevine, it should get done in the next couple of weeks. An expansion, therefore, should be formally announced too. I just realized my mic wasn't perfectly perfectly centered. That's going to bother me while I'm lying in bed at night. But I do not think that this media rights deal will be any longer than, I'll say, seven years maximum. Absolute maximum. I think it'll be, I don't, it's not going to be like a three or four year deal, obviously. That's not how they work. I would imagine you'll be in the five to seven range. I really couldn't see it going over eight, but I think they're going to be in the five to seven range here because I do anticipate them adding expansion teams. So with that in mind, you are then going to have two programs that have to prove their worth of sorts athletically to the conference. And they are not going to be full media rights members from an earnings standpoint right away. And nobody is that comes from the G5, right? Utah was not right away. They are now but they were not when they first joined the Pac-12 back in 2011. So if you have two G5 teams, that changes the calculus on what the timeline would be. Unless the TV the TV network executives can work out a deal that says, okay, if you're adding these schools, we anticipate they're going to be worth this much down the line. So we'll say they make this much for this many years, but then it kicks in later. That's when you could see a deal go for 10 years or so. But I anticipate it'll be I'll, I'll say my prediction is a six-year deal. That 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 is what I would guess. And then once the two teams they've added, I suspect will be San Diego State and SMU, can kind of establish themselves and show what they are worth to the TV networks, then you can reassess at that time and determine whether or not the valuation needs to go up, the valuation needs to stay the same, or whether the valuation needs to go down depending on how things play out. But I, I do not think you're going to see a 15, 20 year, you, you know, deal like the ACC has, or you know, the Big 12s goes from now until 2030. I imagine they'll probably try and wrap it up or 2024, I guess, um, when when Oklahoma and Texas leave. That's running till the 2030, 31 season in the Big 12. I think the Pac-12 will be in, in a similar area there. Whether or not they would view it as a strategic advantage to wrap it up before the Big 12's current deal expires and have it end in you know 2029 or 2028, that that that's for George Klyovkov, his office, and and everybody to figure out. But just to recap, as long as they're in the ballpark of the Big 12 and the ACC, which is 30 million and above, with an absolute max ceiling, I think of the high 30s and probably around a six-year deal. That would be my guess, those would be my goals uh, for for the conference personally. And I do think that those are, are attainable. Now, who the broadcast partners will be is is interesting, which I will uh, touch on here after I talk to you about Built Bars, which are really fantastic. They are so fantastic that they taste like a candy bar, but they're definitely not a candy bar because they're 130 calories, four grams of sugar, but 17 grams of protein. Covered in 100% real chocolate. Healthy is actually tasty with Built. They're so delicious, you'll think they're good for you after you eat them because you will feel good. And then you will get the double satisfaction of knowing, wow, that tasted really good too. And they've got a bunch of amazing flavors. I'm a mint brownie guy myself, but there are a lot of others out there. So you can get your next order at Built.com or you can go to nearest Walmart or Sam's Club to pick up your next box of Built Bars. Walmart, Sam's Club, Built.com. Go get your next order of Built Bars today. So who will be involved with the Pac-12 media deal is a fascinating question. So Turner and CBS reportedly, according to Brett McMurphy of the Action Network, pulled out after they were looking at the primetime slot. Now, I had heard that CBS was interested in that primetime East Coast window, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. 
but at the end of the day, they determined that it was too expensive or what they, they couldn't find a number. I don't know exactly why everything fizzled out on that front, but that's what they were looking for. So what I have been told by people more connected than myself is that ESPN's interest, which is very real and they're still involved, is to go after Pac-12 after dark because while it takes a lot of flack, it's actually a big advantage for the conference in some sense. It's a disadvantage in others, but you also can't change geography and time zones. So what are you going to do? But that's something they can provide that nobody else really can because the Mountain West has their deal inked with CBS Sports and there's no other Power 5 conference that could play that late in the day. But the Pac-12, of course, can. Amazon is expected to be involved. And I think we've anticipated that for a long time here on the show. That appears to be moving forward. The question is whether or not there will be a third cable partner or broadcast partner that will get into the fold. That could be another streaming service like Apple Plus. That could be another cable channel that no one is really talking about right now. We don't really know, right? Until I'd heard, I, I, I'd heard that CBS was poking around and looking at it and that they were interested in hearing you know, what the offers kind of were. But I had not heard that Turner was involved right until it was reported that they were no longer a part of the negotiations and the media rights deal. And I think those two pulling out means the Pac-12 is aware of what figures they are chasing, what dollar figures they're going to be able to get. And if those two potential broadcast partners have pulled themselves out of the discussions, I think it's reasonable to infer that the league is getting closer and closer to having its deal done with those who are going to be involved. I anticipate ESPN. I anticipate Amazon. I would say it's looking 50-50 right now, whether or not there will be a third partner. Who that could be, it's a a John Mulaney line when he was talking about what kids should be able to put on a test because they're 9 or 10 years old. Who's to say? Um, Love John Mulaney. Great, great stand-up comic. But Bud Everts with a great question there. And another one here from Connor Phillips. Do you value rivalries when discussing Pac-12 expansion? I always love the final week of conference play in the Pac-12 because it seems that every team has a solid rival. Is this an important factor to you? Hold on. I need a sip of water. Okay. That was less a sip and more of a small gulp. But I got to keep myself going. I do a lot of talking in uh, my line of work. That's kind of how this works. So he appears to be asking me personally whether I value rivalries. The answer to that question is yes. I, Spencer McLaughlin, I don't know about Spencer C. McLaughlin Esquire, who we're going to hear from tomorrow. I personally do. Rivalries are so important, in my view, to a conference's football schedule. Because a rivalry game draws in your conference's fans more than normal But perhaps more importantly, when you're talking about getting eyeballs on the league to watch your teams play, you draw in other fans from all over the country. And this is true in basketball as well. Think of college basketball. Give me a rivalry. Did Duke, North Carolina pop into your head? Popped into mine. I've been watching that game since I was really young. I remember Tyler Hansborough. I remember Austin Rivers shot. I remember all sorts of stuff in that rivalry. And it's not what it used to be, unfortunately, without Roy Williams and Coach K there. But again, that's me, a West Coast kid, watching ACC basketball because it's Duke, North Carolina. I remember watching the Iron Bowl. I watch it most years. Not this year because Auburn was terrible. But I remember... The kick six. I remember Bryce Young scraping his way back to get his team to a national championship game, not this past year, but the year before. Those sorts of games, Georgia, Florida, Michigan, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Texas, all games that have appeal that go far beyond just your own conference's fans. And so when I look at the rivalries that exist in the Pac-12, I hope one day there will be even more. But there are some pretty good ones out there. And unfortunately, USC and UCLA are leaving, which sucks because I talked about it during the season. It seemed like USC and Utah were kind of starting to formulate that little bit of rivalry. Caleb Williams is taunting them with pain on the nails. 
close game in Salt Lake City, controversial officiating, play again in the Pac-12 title game. You have USC fans on the one hand saying, well, you know, if Caleb Williams hadn't gotten hurt and all that sort of stuff, like all of that materializes over time into a rivalry. You can't fake a rivalry. I mean, they've been they've been trying kind of because they got added together to push Utah and Colorado, but Colorado has been irrelevant. So there's no rivalry there. There's no juice, but going forward, the game to watch in the PAC 12, I think there are, there are two, at least in the immediate future, Oregon, Washington and Oregon, Utah, those games going forward have appeal that go beyond just the PAC 12 because people know Utah now. And a lot of people know Oregon and they know Washington too. And that Oregon Washington game last year exemplifies exactly what I'm talking about. That was, I believe one of the most viewed games in the conference a year ago because it's a great rivalry because they're great teams and it was a great game. You need those sorts of things. Now on the realignment front, that is how I feel about rivalries and their importance to a conference. University presidents don't really give a darn. USC has no real rivals in the Big Ten. There will be some intriguing matchups for sure. USC Michigan, USC Ohio State. Oh, by the way, I meant to talk about this earlier. I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow. Ohio State, the Ohio State, pulled out of a home and home down the line with Washington. This is after Michigan pulled out of a home and home with UCLA. Cowards. Okay, that's all I can say about that right now. I could go on a 20-minute rant about scheduling. Yeah, we'll probably do that tomorrow. Anyway, so where was I? Right, non-conference games or big-time big time rivalry games. USC and UCLA will have their game. And the battle for Los Angeles now being in the Big Ten is a boon for the conference. And it's a consideration, sure. But it's not a primary factor or I frankly not even in the top 10 list of reasons as to why one team goes from this conference to that conference or from the G5 to the Power Five. It doesn't crack the top 10 list of reasons for them. It's like a nice added perk. You know, it's like if you order a dessert and it's apple pie a la mode. And they end up saying, we, we had an extra slice of, you know, just like a little sliver of pecan pie as well. So we put that on your plate. You didn't ask for it. You don't need it. But once it's there, you go, oh, that's really nice. Might as well have it. So those schools going to the Big Ten, there's no rivalries there. There's no history with Minnesota or Maryland, Indiana, Michigan State, Rutgers. Like, it's just, it's just not, Right. It's not high on their on their priority list. But I do think once you start to build things up, rivalries are really, really good. And they're really, really fun too. It's, it's what makes college sports, I think, the most distinct from the professional ranks. In the NFL, you know, I, I've been told for a long time the Steelers and Ravens have a big rivalry, which I'm sure amongst their fans they do. I, as a Seahawks fan, don't care. I, I I just want to watch the, the best players. It's like it's, it's it doesn't it doesn't intrigue me very much. But in college football, Alabama Alabama Georgia Georgia Florida Alabama Auburn Michigan Ohio State Texas Oklahoma keep going down the list. Yeah, those are fun games to watch. Or if like a Florida Florida State, heck, even smaller ones like Iowa Iowa State, I'm totally here for it. I freaking love rivalries, but doesn't play into uh, expansion as much. But great question, Connor. There's uh, another one to answer that is uh, most intriguing as well. And the question I want to ask before that question that came in from my guy, John, is why haven't you checked out FanDuel yet? I don't know. I, 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 I really don't know. It's the midway point of the NBA season. And it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're thrilled to have them as our official sports book sponsor here at Locked On. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. 
That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Yeah, really neat little thing. Plus, they've got the FanDuel Sportsbook app, safe, secure, super easy to use. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. Don't wait. And don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with Fanduel, an official sportsbook betting partner of the NBA. All right, final mailbag question here today on the show. And there will be another one to lead tomorrow's show. If you ever want to be a part of it, I greatly appreciate it. I love answering your guys' questions. You often come up with really good ones. You can hit me up on YouTube in the comment section or Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pack 12 DMs always wide open or just hop in the Twitter mentions, whatever works. John comes back with another question after having one last week and says, Hey Spencer, thanks for answering my question. You're so welcome. Thanks for asking. You made some great points in today's show. You flatter me, sir. I especially like your comments on academics, influencing conferences and the reminder that it's university presidents that make these decisions, not the ADs. Ding, ding, ding. Five points for Gryffindor. I have another Pac-12 question for you. It's pretty obvious that UCLA and USC were essentially forced to the Big Ten based on debt for their programs and the current media contract undervaluing them. I know Oregon is sitting in a great spot financially. Thanks, Phil. I'm not wrong. How are the other schools sitting with regard to debt burden? If the other schools are at least stable, then I would think the Pac is going to be more than okay moving forward. So, the question here, I, I don't think it's entirely hitting the nail on the head. I think you kind of hit half of it there. Uh, let me address one one other thing there. And that was, uh, you know, they wanted to go to the Big Ten because U- UCLA and USC were forced there because they were undervalued in the media rights deal. That is partially true. It's not the whole story, but it is partially true because the pack, like the other conferences, frankly, went to equal media revenue sharing. And so UCLA and USC were on some level kind of peeved about that saying, wait a minute, we're the ones with the big TV market. We're bringing in a lot of money, but we're not getting the direct amount that goes into the conference, which I understand that frustration, but I also understand where the conference is coming from saying, we want everyone to be able to succeed. We want everyone to be able to grow and we we want to grow together as one conference. So by giving everyone the same amount from the media rights deal, you are giving other schools like an Oregon State or a Washington State the opportunity to do that when they might not otherwise have it. And they're already at a, a major disadvantage. Like I I tend to lean more towards equal revenue sharing being in the best interest of a conference right up until you have this situation arise with the uh, USC and, and UCLA. So th- there were a number of reasons why they went to the Big Ten. Money, academic fit, 100% there competitiveness, like the, the, you can go down the the list of reasons there. And that was a, a part of it. But on, on the deck question, nobody that I'm aware of is in as bad of a situation financially as UCLA has gotten themselves into. Like they have a lot of, of debt in their athletic department, but here's the thing. I don't think even UCLA is that worried about it. And I don't think it was one of the top reasons that they ended up going to the big 10. Most, this this is going to come as a surprise to some perhaps, most athletic departments in the United States, Division I or Division I AA or Division II, whatever, do not make money. First of all, they're set up as nonprofits so that they don't get taxed on all this stuff, which is why you have scholarships available. Well, that that has a Title IX factor as well. But how can you build a brand new you know, volleyball facility at X school? Is it because the volleyball program brought in millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars in surplus that they needed to put back somewhere? No, that's not how it works. It's because all a a university athletic department is trying to do is break even. Like that's what the best ones actually do. And then any profit that they do have, which is a very, 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 very select few, the ones that do do that are then putting it back into their other athletics programs, right? That's how the, the cycle sort of works. But far more athletic departments than people realize fail to break even, which is their goal, right? Where expenses equal revenue. That's what they're shooting for. It's a hard thing to attain. 
because you aren't charging, you know, $150 for third level seats at a college basketball game. I mean, most college basketball programs lose money on the net. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. So I am unaware of any school being in that sort of, of situation financially as UCLA has been in. And I'm sure it was a factor that they could get more money and start to close that gap. But if they really had to and really, really needed to, and it was such a big problem, UCLA is, let's just say, a very wealthy institution, and they could start to chip away at that pretty easily. Their, their total endowment, the amount of money that school has is in the billions, Man, many billions. So having some debts here of tens of millions, that, that that's not, it, it's not something to ignore but it's also not the hugest deal in the word. I don't know if hugest is actually a, a word, but to to answer your final part of the question here, if the other schools are at least stable, then I would think the pack is going to be more than okay moving forward. Yeah, that's the situation that they're in right now. There's no one who's financially strapped that would also have an option to go to a conference that could pay them dramatically more to help them close that gap. That that's that's not something that exists for any of of those uh, of the ten remaining schools right now. But great question. Keep them coming again. YouTube, Twitter, however you want. Appreciate everyone listening. See you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day.